Welcome to another special edition of our Community Access. This special edition is one of a special visitor that came into our studio. Mr. Stanley Williams, PhD, author, film producer, and lecturer. Mr. Stanley Williams, PhD, author, film producer, and lecturer. Now, with the interview is our Terry Styles. Terry? Hi, I'm Terry Styles. Welcome to a very special edition of our Community Access. In the studio today, I have a guest who is a award-winning writer, filmmaker, producer, aficionado of anything written, I think, Dr. Stanley Williams. Thank you for coming to join us today. Well, I'm really you, excited to, to have you here. here. I, I, the list goes on and on, but you have your PhD in filmmaking, correct? Uh, it's, technically, it's in uh, narrative theory, uh, but it, it focused on major motion picture films, yeah. and my experience is all in filmmaking, so... So I've had my shoes in a couple of those positions, directing, producing, and writing. And of the three, the, the idea starts with the writing, right? But that's the hardest thing. It is the hardest really. thing. So how, how does that come about and how do you formulate, because you're a consultant to Hollywood yeah. in formulating the stories, correct? Well, not so much in formulating the stories, but helping the stories get form formatted or formulated okay. so they connect to audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I I'm, I'm participate a little bit in the story conception, but, uh, and I've been in those story concept ideas, but generally the, the idea is already established of what they want to do. And then my expertise and all my research and my academic work as well as my practical work is how do you formulate and format and structure a story so that it connects to audience and audiences. And there are some very ancient natural law rules about how do you tell a story about that. But um, my, my practical experience is all in making films and videos and, and even some live shows and stuff like that. Well, you're also a business owner, and that's of a production company? You might call it that, yeah. It's we we. I have three businesses. There is one LLC, but under that LLC, there's like three aspects of the business. One, I do a lot of script consulting in Hollywood and with novelists. Uh, I do produce things, um, and then I do a lot of um, well, not a lot. I do a lot of consulting, but I do some distribution. So I have a little distribution company. Some of my friends couldn't get things distributed, so I, I helped them out. We started a, a thing called Nineveh's Crossing that distributes mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. But um, most of it is uh, production and develop, development production. So, I mean, when we talk about film production, in my case, being a filmmaker, we develop the ideas, we produce them, shoot them, edit them. And then we seek distribution. And if I can't find distribution otherwise, then I have to distribute it myself. Yourself. Yeah. You make it sound so easy when you just rattle it off. And I got so excited to talk oh, to you and hear you talk that I didn't even go back into your history. So you got started actually in college, yeah. and it was in physics, correct? Yeah, right, yeah. I, I was always interested in science. Uh, I grew up. Astronomy was kind of like a hobby, and then when the space program kicked off, when I was in the uh, fourth grade, and uh, Sputnik was launched and Explorer uh -huh, and all yeah. that, I just it just totally captivated my attention, and so I, I had this dream that I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I wasn't quite that smart enough at the time. They they just were taking the cream of the crop, oh, you sure. know, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I got my degree in physics at a small Christian liberal arts school down in southern Illinois called Greenville College, 
Well, I, I had to go there because my folks had both gone there and had graduated oh, from Greenville. So <laughs> I, I didn't have a choice. Right. And I had no idea how lucky I was because my physics professor worked summers as a research scientist uh. at McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. And I thought I would go on to graduate school. I was engaged my senior year to, to my wife now, Pamela. And we, um, we didn't know how we were going to get married because we, I didn't really have any income. I was talking about going right. to graduate school Being and that student, cost money and all that sort of stuff. Well, my nephew and I, during spring break, uh, he came down in his little Triumph and he drove me and rather, you'd think that we would go to Florida and to the beaches or something sure. like that. Well, that's, we were kind of the nerds. We went to the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston oh, to tour neat. NASA. Yeah. And uh, on the way home from that little three-day trip down there, just touring the center and, and watching mm -hmm. the movies and doing that kind of crazy stuff. spacey stuff. Yeah. Because uh, he was into all that too. We stopped at a phone booth uh, by a mall near, this is just south of Houston, and I re still remember to this day making a phone call back to college where my wife, well, my fiance Pam, uh, was kind of getting my mail and stuff like that. And she says, hey Stan, she said, you got a, you got a letter from McDonnell Douglas. I said, you know, this astronautics in yeah. St. Louis. I said, really? Well. I had not made an application or anything. She opened it up, and here was a job offer. My it was goodness. a job offer to be an electronic engineer in the space program. <laughs> and I had, not applied, I had not applied for this or anything. Ah. And my grades weren't that good, Terry. Huh. I, might, I, was, I was a B student, B minus, mm -hmm. maybe. But I was not an A student. And I got this unsolicited request. Well, the only thing we can figure out mm -hmm. is that I was one of five physics graduates that year. And our professor probably made a recommendation mm -hmm. to McDonnell Douglas. Mm -hmm. and, and even though our grades weren't that good at Greenville, Greenville had such a stellar reputation in the sciences. Um, it was a mm -hmm. pre-med school for chemistry students, but the director of our physics program, Ralph Miller, was the president of the Illinois Physics Educational Association or something like that. Wow. So it had this incredible reputation. So, so I, I, I took the job. We got married. And uh, I ended up working for NASA and training astronauts at the Manned Spacecraft Center for years. But all the time, both in college, I, was, I spent more time in the radio station in college than I did in the physics lab. They were next to each other. And I, just, I was just fascinated with the practical applications of physics and media. And even when I was at McDonnell Douglas, I was the staff photographer. So I had a badge. I can go anywhere in NASA mm, I want and nice. take pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was in media down there as well. So when that job folded, Skylab, uh, it was the Skylab program that I worked on. And the first uh, orbital space station we had. When mm -hmm. that folded, I decided I wanted to get into photography. Well, I ended up at Ford Motor Company, and they said, no, we don't want you in the dark room. We're going to put you in the television and film department really? because you think your technical background suits you better for making films. I had never thought of making films or Child videos or anything. I was, just, I was going to be happy working in the dark room, Terry. Sure. And uh, so that's where I got my, the real practical experience in terms of training was in my um, mid-20s and late-20s when I worked at, my, uh, at Ford headquarters and in film, television, and um, making movies. So that's where I got my training. And, and that was prior to your PhD. Oh, yeah, yeah. My PhD didn't come until I was 20 years later. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good. Congratulations. Yeah, I, got my, I started my uh, doctorate program at Wayne State mm -hmm. in my uh, oh. mid-50s. No, no, I'm sorry, in my mid-40s. Yeah. yeah, so I got my, my PhD when I was like 50-something. And so when you were at Ford, you began to also write training? Yeah, we did mostly. I, I mean, I started out as kind of a technical gopher, you know, working in the television mm -hmm. department and learning all the stuff, mm -hmm. television and technology, mm -hmm. replacing plumbicon tubes and all this sort oh of and, and ancient programs, uh, mm -hmm. ancient stuff. And we worked our way up through the technology and ended up with quad broadcasting and all that. But in the process, they had a hiring freeze and they still needed to get these little dinky little programs done and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started doing them just on the side, you know, for my job. And they, they were, were training programs. Yeah, they were training programs or they were public relations oh, programs, okay. mm -hmm. training, 
uh, information, kind of orientation stuff, things like that. So is that where the yeah. writing experience started? Yeah. It, what happened, it, while I was doing it, they had a staff of writers, and I was not one of the staff writers. But oftentimes, I would get a script that I was supposed to direct and produce. Mm -hmm. It did not make sense logically. Oh. And I would have to rewrite it. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have things happening on different sides of the set, you know, as if they were on the yes. same side. And I said, the guys that are physically over here, you can't do that. So I would start just rewriting scripts so that you could shoot them and so that the talent would flow and things would make logical sense. And that probably came from my... At NASA, I... I uh, wrote and corrected checklists, in-flight checklists for the, oh, for the okay. crew. Wow. So that That's forced you to be really right. logical. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I probably had a little bit of that in my DNA, but I mean, that training at NASA just made me really linear in my thinking. And uh, so that probably helped. So I started writing then, and then, so I won't go into the long story, but I, I left voluntarily Ford on my birthday one year and started my own production company and uh, ended up contracting back to Ford all sorts of really wonderful projects because I had worked my way up and proved myself at Ford. And then they had a, they had a big organizational change at Ford. And I, I chose to leave rather than become part of the new mm -hmm. organization. So, and then and, you became a contractor. Yeah, I became a contractor for Ford for years. And I worked for, then my production company did stuff for Ford, GM, Chrysler, General uh, Foods. Um, and eventually, uh, that closed down when we had a recession, and then I went back and worked for some of the agencies that, for maybe three or four years, and then I just, I said, this is nuts, and so I just started doing my own thing. I was, I had enough credits at that point, and, mm -hmm. and a, sure. a few awards, and mm -hmm. so I just started freelancing. And I, to this day, you know, I'm still, I, I'm not freelancing for the automobile company, I'm producing my own stuff now. But, um, for the automobile company. No, no, I'm, I'm producing it for myself. I mean, we're working on a romantic comedy right now. Right. I mean, I have contacts in Hollywood and, and around, and so... I'm just going to mention Annalise, Annalise. Yeah, Annalise, right. Annalise is a new romantic comedy. And I definitely want to get to that. Okay. Um, but I do also want to talk about the book that you wrote and how you got to Moral Promise. Well, um... So you're That's, an author as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've written a couple books. Actually, when I was working at Ford, uh, although I was a producer director at Ford, we and not really on the writing staff. Like mm -hmm. I said, sometimes I'd have to mm -hmm. edit scripts, mm -hmm. but there were times where they needed a manual or they needed something written, mm -hmm. and sometimes I would take that on because I knew more about the topic than anybody else. And then when I had my own production company called Full Circle mm -hmm. Communications. We ended up producing a lot of print material, and I ended up writing some of that as well okay. for right. automobile companies. Mm -hmm. Well, Terry, I, I, maybe I probably don't need to explain too much of this, but except that, you know, in the corporate communication world, sure. especially for the automobile companies mm -hmm. and, and the kind of stuff I was doing, I was doing sales training for, I was doing a lot of sales training for automobile dealerships. And about the sixth time, I'm not kidding here, about the sixth time I had to produce a new script on how to lease a car to a new customer <laughs> rather than sell it to them, I said, you know, there's got to be more to life than this. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just spinning my wheels teaching salesmen how to lease cars rather than sell them because the automobile companies made more money off right, the leases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, had, I had won a number of awards locally and a couple international awards for my industrial stuff. And so and I was just bored. I was bored out of my head. And after doing the same thing over and over yeah. and over again, especially the way you started out at NASA, yeah. and now you're doing the same thing over and over yeah. again. Yeah, and, and it was nice. Good mm -hmm. people. I was working for good people sure, and all that. Right. But I just got bored. And someone said to me, well, Stan, why don't you um, go to Hollywood and make movies? And I laughed at them. And I think my laughter was appropriate, Terry. I don't probably need to tell you this. Uh, tell people out there <laughs> the difference between making industrial training and public relations and image films for mm -hmm. automobile mm -hmm. companies mm -hmm. or even for General Foods is worlds away from what is done in Hollywood. And I didn't know how different it was, except I knew it was hugely different. I mean, I was a movie fan, you know, and I sure, read the, right. the stuff and the articles. I subscribed to American Cinematographer, so I knew all the technical stuff that happened on a set, mm -hmm. and I knew that I wasn't anywhere close to doing that. would be daunting. Oh, it was very daunting. <laughs> so I decided that I had to get some education. And I was most interested in 
how the stories. I was mm -hmm. most interested in stories. I, I understood the technology. You know, my mm -hmm. physics background, so, mm -hmm. and uh, I and by this time I had a master's degree in mass comm, um, mm -hmm. and so and I I knew how interpersonal things worked on a film crew, and I, I knew a lot. Right, right. But one thing that was a mystery to me, and I seemed a mystery to a lot of people, was how is a how does a story work? How do you form so it? that it really connects with audiences, right. and people would say. Oh, nobody knows anything. You know, you, you make a film and you don't know if the audience is going to like it or not. And I, you, and I've been, I've been to Hollywood, even shooting some stuff for mm -hmm. Chrysler and General Other Motors. Mm -hmm. And I, you look, you just drive through Beverly Hills and you say, I'm sorry, but this whole adage <laughs> that no one knows anything is facetious. Someone Somebody knows something. <laughs> look at these houses. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> and and I've been on some. Um, some stages just for meetings, mm -hmm. not to shoot anything. And I said, no, I'm sorry. They know something. Yes. What's going on here? So um, I went to Wayne State, and they allowed me to uh, construct uh, my own curriculum, essentially. So I studied story structure. And everything I read, so it took me five years to get my doctorate mm -hmm. after my master's. It was part-time. Mm -hmm. And I... I, every, all my research, all my papers, wherever I could, dealt with the structure of successful stories. Whether, and you could study novels or short stories, but it was much easier studying films because mm -hmm. you could watch them mm -hmm. and analyze them. Right. So out of that, um, did my dissertation, all that, and got my degree in 1998. And I... Um, I, I, I had discovered some things about story structure that I thought some of my friends in Hollywood ought to, be, ought to know or ought to teach. And so I knew some educational people in, in some of the film schools out in So LA. by this time you've made friends in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. I've been to Hollywood a number of times right. and making, <laughs> uh, making films for the automobile companies, sure, not, right. not for Hollywood. And so uh, I, and I was always interested in what was going on out there. So I was... I was always reading and, and, and making acquaintances, sure. but nothing, I had never thought of going there or doing anything. And so I, I, I and people, they didn't want to do anything. Somebody from Michigan doesn't know anything, right? I mean, this is the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You're out of sight, out of mind, and you don't know anything. And I thought, I'm sorry, guys, but there's I, my dissertation re researched all kinds of successful and unsuccessful films, and there was a pattern to it. There was a real pattern as to what made a story really? connect. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so I, there was these theories and these ideas. Actually, there were theories. There were things that you could prove statistically. I mean, mm -hmm. you could prove not with st statistics, but with actual population numbers of box office scores and stuff. Right. And I Speaks thought, value. this is some So anyhow, in 2005, I just, the passion struck me. No one in Hollywood would listen to me, so I wrote a book. And I just started writing a book called that eventually was called The Moral Premise, mm -hmm. Harnessing Virtue and Vice for Box Office Success. Mm -hmm. And it was based on ancient natural law concepts, a story structure that's been around since human beings. It's nothing new. I didn't invent something. I just said, everyone's talking about this, but they're calling it something different. Let's, the coaling idea or the central theme mm -hmm. or the, mm -hmm. the psychological spine. I said, you know, you're all dealing with the pro concept of a premise, mm -hmm. and it all has to do with natural law, virtue or vice, universal value sort of stuff, you know, and, and it's essentially, you know, if, if someone does something, if, if a character behaves in a way that is good for everyone around them, good stuff, ha it's the whole karma idea, good stuff happens, Correct. but if you are selfish or if you're greedy or, or you're something like that, mm -hmm, right. bad stuff's going to happen right. to you. Well, this happens in real life. Of course. <laughs> but it also should happen, and it does. And this is one of the natural laws of storytelling, is that when your characters do this, they can expect consequences to follow natural law. Mm -hmm. So that's a real simple way that the, con the moral premise is explained, except it, 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 uh, except it applies to everything. So I wrote this book, and I... I, I wrote the book based on what I felt and, and what I was seeing and what I was measuring because I had done quantitative and qualitative research for my dissertation. And I sent it off to one of my favorite Hollywood book publisher, which is Michael Weisey Books, or Productions they call it, but it's really a, the publishing arm. And uh, I got an email back 
48 hours later and says, Stan, we love your book. We want to publish it. <laughs> I, I was so surprised. You had the key. <laughs> yeah, I so want to hear more it, yeah. about the book in a minute. We'll be right back. Okay. Don't go away. Welcome back to our Community Access. Today we are being joined by Dr. Stanley Williams. We were just talking about your book, The Moral Premise, which I'm amazed. You said that Hollywood picked it up in two days, yeah, 20, two, yeah, 48 hours. That, right. And so you, because of that book, you've been consulting, right? That <laughs> yeah. led to you consulting Hollywood films. Yeah, I, I'll tell you the story how that really started. Um, I was not expecting it. I'm sitting in my office in Novi, Michigan, uh, doing something on the internet. I forget what it was. This goes back to 2007, I guess. And I get a phone call from a lady, and she says, uh, I, is this Dr. Williams? And I said, yes. I says, Stanley Williams, right? I said, yes. Oh, good. Uh, because the only Stanley Williams that we could find on the internet was Stanley Tukey Williams, who's in prison in San Quentin. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not me. And, um, and you're said, not a rapper, right? No, no. And he said, so you wrote the moral premise? He says, yeah. I said, well, my boss wrote it, uh, read your book. He loves it, and he wants to talk to you. I said, oh, that's great. Who's your boss? And she says, Will Smith. <laughs> and I said, now, yeah, I understand. I, I mean, I knew who Will Smith was, yeah. but not at that instant I didn't. And I, blank, total blank. Aww. I says, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. And I'm faking it now, right? I said, yeah, what's the name of his production company? She says, Overbrook Entertainment. Typing real quickly into the computer. <laughs> There's you know, static on the line. You know, and, the, and the search engine worked, you know, and it comes oh, up. Goodness. Oh, my goodness, that Will Smith. Oh, oh yeah, I really, really. <laughs> So anyhow, that started a, um, a multi-year relationship with mm. Will and mm -hmm. Overbrook, and I ended up uh, consulting on 13 of his projects. Oh, fantastic. Uh, about not quite half of those were made. Um, the rest are still in the file <laughs> waiting for funding. But um, ah, right. it, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I did work with him, and, uh, and we, I, I've been to L.A., and I won't say everything, but you mm -hmm. know, it, sure. was, it was a really good relationship, and I met a lot of really interesting people and sat at the table with some really, you know, rollers and stuff. But um, what's really fascinating is that even Will Smith cannot get movies made. I mean, that's how hard it is making a movie. Is it the funding or it's just the, funding. the stories? Yeah, or what is it, there a it really it really gets down to the fact that there's got to be enough people willing to pay money to pay back See. the investors. Mm -hmm. That's what it gets. There are plenty of good stories in Hollywood, everywhere. Isn't that sad? But you have to find an audience. And that's why uh, most studios will not make a film unless there's already an audience out there that's chomping at the bit mm. for a movie. So it doesn't even have to be a good movie for it to make money, as long as there's a ready audience mm -hmm. for it. Right, right. So, if, so I tell writers, you want to make a movie out of your novel? first sell 50 million copies of your book and then I guarantee you a movie will be made of your novel really? okay, because so you there has formula. to be an audience sure. to buy the tickets to pay True. back the investors True. it's so expensive and then you have to keep your fingers crossed for a sequel. Yeah. <laughs> There's one thing I want to ask you. You wrote great stories are about likable characters with impossible goals and I totally related to that even though it's so hard for me to write, period. But what is your advice to a writer beyond this? Well, it's actually, my, my advice to a writer is that the first thing you need for a great story, there's, there's two things you need for okay. a great story. Mm -hmm. One is a hook. This goes back to Aristotle's mm -hmm. polemics. Mm -hmm. And it's like you need one hook, an mm -hmm. impossibility, a physical impossibility that the writer through their craft makes reasonable and plausible. So the movie Splash was about a young man yeah. who falls in love with a mermaid. Right. An impossible concept, right. right? But everything else after that impossibility, that there's a mermaid and he falls in love with her, Everything that f after that has to follow natural law. It has to be real. Possibility. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you have one impossibility. Ah. So Aristotle says uh, a good movie or, or a good story uh, has to be about something impossible made reasonable. It's not about something possible that you just make convenient. Um, and the second thing is that you have to have a true moral premise. And, mm -hmm. the, and the moral premise is that the value conflict in the characters' minds mm -hmm. that is, is really what the story is really about. And that value then art, articulates their actions 
And so the actions that we see on the screen that are in conflict, mm -hmm. the fight, the battle, and all that, right. those are simply metaphors for the moral values that are going on inside the character's head. So that's what the movie is really about. So the, what you see physically on the screen is a metaphor for what's really going on. And the moral premise explains all that and how to implement all that because it applies to every aspect of the art. Thank you for that advice. I hope it helps me the next time I try to start okay. writing. I really can't thank you enough for coming to join us today. I really appreciate it. And I could sit here and talk to you for days and days and days. And then I'd feel like I was using you. <laughs> but thank you for coming here. Welcome. And I do want to mention, you have done talks around the area. You do yeah. instruction around the area. If people want to get in contact with you or have you maybe the best visit thing, their lectures yeah it, it, i have um, one main my main website is stanwilliams.com and i have a number of okay. things that i do like giving workshops i gave yes. a workshop just the other day uh, at the rochester uh -huh. writers conference and we're doing another one yeah. novi and i and i i do them in la now and then and dallas and st louis and i, I move around a little bit uh, not so much anymore because i'm producing a film now but um, stanwilliams.com or themoralpremise.com, actually just moralpremise.com. And there's contact information on those websites. And also on that website, you can also, we didn't get to touch on Annalise Annalise. Annalise Annalise, new romantic comedy. And that is so comedy. cute, I love yeah. it. I'm, I'm excited to see more. There's three trailers on that, or is it uh, two There's right actually now? going to be seven webisodes up. We posted uh, the fourth trailer last night. There's actually going to oh, be okay. a trailer for each of the webisodes. And so there's going to be eventually seven. I posted the fourth one last night. And the webisodes are essentially to generate general interest to create a crowdfunding campaign to fund the movie. So the movie is not funded yet. So we've, I've funded the webisodes, and the webisodes kind of tell the backstory of the characters. And we're having a lot of fun with them. And now is that something that you're filming here? Yeah, we filmed it all in Novi. And, and local, local yeah. actors. All, yeah, and right, right. Oh, really talented. She's local. adorable. Both of them, the two girls are adorable. Wow. Well, I can't wait to... And, wait, have you seen Phil Powers and the therapy one yet? Is that the fourth one? Well, no. Actually, therapy, when she goes to see her shrink, the fourth is one. the first one. Oh, It's okay. the first one. And that's up on the web. Yeah, go yeah, look at I it. Yeah, I watched them all. Well, but it's therapy, adorable. Maybe yeah. I didn't... I've, evidently, it's, I didn't... But Phil, oh, Phil is a long-time comic actor. Oh. Many, many feature films. He's absolutely fabulous. And are Very you funny. the writer on this? I wrote it, and I'm directing it, and I'm it's producing it, and I'm adorable. editing it. It's adorable. I have no money to hire anybody else. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> you can look for some volunteers. <laughs> you have to go on the website. It's stanwilliams.com. Correct. Correct. And, and search around that website. It's fascinating. Everything that you've done is fascinating. And Thank I'm you. in love with Annalise. Oh, Annalise, yeah. Annalise, Annalise. We are, too. And, 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 and Annalise is played by a very talented actress named Sydney Lepora, who <laughs> uh, lives in Sterling Heights. And um, she's a graduate of she Wayne State. Uh, she's a thespian from Wayne State. And very funny, beautiful woman. We'll keep our fingers crossed for her. Thank yeah. you for joining us today, and thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. We thank you, Mr. Williams, and we thank you for watching our Community Access. I'm Bill Service, and we hope to see you again on our Community Access. I used to think news is news. It's all the same, but it's not. There's a big difference between local broadcast news and cable news. See, local stations are part of my community, connecting me to local news, weather, and sports on every device. It makes sense. Get the news from the people I trust who actually live here. No agenda, no bias like on cable, shout shows, or social media. Just facts. For news I can trust, I stay local. Support your local stations. Text TV to 52886 today. Oh